Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining this evening, Corporate Connect, featuring Far East Orchard Limited, as well as our audience from Facebook Live. This webinar is organized by SIAS and supported by SGX. Far East Orchard is a real estate company with a lodging platform that aims to achieve sustainable and recurring income to a diversified and balanced portfolio. Listed on SGX main board since 1968, the group is a member of the Far East organization, Singapore's largest private property developer. Established since 1967, Fice Orchard has developed residential, commercial, hospitality, and purpose-built student accommodation properties in Australia, Malaysia, Singapore, and the United Kingdom. The group also holds a portfolio of purpose-built medical suites for lease and for sale in Singapore's premier medical hub in Novena. Through its hospitality arm, Fais Hospitality, Far East Orchard owns more than 10 hospitality assets and manages over 100 properties with close to 18,000 rooms in Australia, Austria, uh, Denmark, Germany, Hungary, Japan, Malaysia, New Zealand, and Singapore. We will kick off tonight's webinar with presentation by Mr. Jeff Howey, Market Strategy from SGX on recent market highlights, followed by the corporate presentation by Mr. Alan Tang, Group. Chief Executive Officer, as well as Ms. Joanna Jo, Chief Financial Officer, and we will end off with a Q&A session. Without further ado, can I invite Mr. Jeff Howey to present? Jeff, over to you. Thank you very much, Eileen, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, pleasure to be here with Far East Orchard, and I promise to take only 10 to 15 minutes maximum just to run through some recent developments in our overall broader stock market. As always, just a kind reminder that this is an educational presentation, not providing advice. And straight into it, just to reiterate that the Straits Times Index has been the strongest performing developed market so far this year. So the SDI has generated a 5.3% total return as of the close today. While in the meantime, the FTSE Developed Index has generated a 14% decline in total return in sing dollar terms. So a couple of reasons why this is the case. Uh, at a sector level, technology, which has been the worst performing global sector in the year to date, accounts for 22% of the FTSE developed index. While the sector only makes up 1.6% of the STI via Venture Corp. The focus on increased Interest rates has also seen banks as one of the globe's most defensive sectors. Banks make up 45% of the SDI compared to only 6% for the FTSE developed index. Now the trio of OCBC, OCB, sorry, sorry, the, excuse me, the trio of DBS, OCBC and UOB have averaged 5% year-to-date total returns. They make up 45% of the SDI, hence have had a big influence on the SDI's 5.2% total return. For the first quarter of this year, combined net interest income for the three banks was 5.4 billion, up from 5.3 billion in the last quarter of last year. Combined non-interest income also grew to 3.4 billion in last quarter, up from 3 billion in the last quarter of last year. So during the 18, first 18 weeks or so for the year, high inflation prints across the world, uh, particularly driven by in, uh, energy prices and supply chain pressures exacerbated by the Ukraine crisis, have seen consensus estimates for the Federal Reserve target band at the end of this next at the, at the end of this year increase from expectations of 75 to 100 basis point band. Uh, as we thought at the end of last year, to 250 to 275, 75 basis point target band uh, as, as we expect currently for the end of the year. So really though, global equity markets, they're currently in more of an oscillating mode than a trending mode. So really markets are taking their cues from significant macro geopolitical events, as well as a the COVID progress that we've got. You can take the STI, for example, this, this, this sharp blue line here in this chart. When you look at the sharp blue line, since ending last year at 31.30, the STI rallied 
to 34, this 3460 level on the 17th of February, then return back to 3130 on the 8th of March, and then return back to the 3460 level on the 29th of March before trading now at uh, sub 3300. So what we've seen is this, this oscillating range, very, very big range trading uh, conditions increase the 30 day annualized volatility of the SDI from up to up, up to 13%, uh, which was really around the 11% level for most of last year. So um, the, the, so the conclusion is wh why we have performed so well, it, it really comes down much to a sector level. If the STI and the FTSE developed index were majority weighted, i.e. more than 50% to the energy sector, then in all likelihood, that would have been an upward trending index for the good part of the year. If they were majority weighted to the technology sector, they would have been in a downtrend for the much of the year. So much has come down to the big names and the big sectors of the indices. And another factor that has also contributed to the STI's defensive gain is that eight stocks have generated double digit percentage gain returns in the year to date, all outpacing the trio of banks. So Semcorp Industries, Jardine Cycle and Carriage, Keppel Corp, Young Zijung Shipbuilding Holdings, City Development, Singtel, Capital Land Investment and SATS are those eight stocks. Of those eight, as many as five, that is Singtel, City Developments, Semcorp Industries, Keppel Corp and Capital Land Investment have ranked among the 10 stocks that have booked the most net institutional inflow so far this year. And total net institutional inflow for Singapore stocks in the year to date is around 420 million Sing dollars. Semcorp Industries has led the STI constituents for much of the year to date. The energy sector, as we said, has also led global stocks. And we've been through the numbers before countless times in these presentations. Um, uh, the company, as we, as we note, is pressing ahead with its strategic transformation of its portfolio from brown to green energy, with the objective of sustainable solutions making up 70% of the portfolio in 2025, up from around 20% in 2020. So there's also been another seven energy and agriculture producer stocks, not within the STI, but among the 100 most traded Singapore stocks this year that have average returns in the vicinity of 55% year to date, which I'll get to very soon. But before then, the Jakarta Composite Index has also generated positive gains in the year to date. It's led the region along with the STI and hence Jardine Cycle and Carriage has been the second best performing SDI stock in the year to date. For Keppel Corp, we know that the conglomerate reported that net profit of 1 billion uh, in 2021, a sharp reversal from the loss of 500 million the year before. Um, and th that was the highest net profit the group had made in the past six years. And it's continuing to accelerate its long-term strategic initiative to transform into that integrated solution provider. So as we've said um, countless times, there's plenty of microeconomic strategic initiative pivots that have also been the key driver of Singapore stocks along obviously with the big macro drivers. But global reopening momentum has also picked up the pace this year. Global daily confirmed COVID cases are now in the vicinity of 500,000 to 600,000 cases a day across the globe. That is well off the 3.4 million highs that we saw in late January amid the onset of Omicron. And that has provided support to the hospitality and the travel related stocks, such as city developments and SATs, which have also led the SDI. And for the real estate sector, we should also add that we're watching other drivers here, such as the response to new launches um, this, this quarter. But the reopening theme has seen SunTech REIT, CDL Hospitality Trust, Far East Hospitality Trust and Ascot Resident Trust lead the S REIT sector so far this year. Last year, we saw retail sales reported to be up 9% year on year in March, reversing that 3.5% decline in Feb. Strengths were in, uh, it was computer and telco, uh, uh, footwear and clothing, cosmetics, toiletries, and importantly, F&B was up 5% year on year. Uh, Changi Airport had more than doubled its passenger volumes in April as well. It was at close to 40% of its pre-COVID levels as of the end of April, which is up from 18% in March. It is expected to be reach 50% uh, by year end. And as we said, those, those confirmed global COVID cases are, are continuing to fall 
And I think it was after the Friday bell last week, um, Mr. Alan Tang and, and the team at Far East Orchard will talk a lot more about this, but we did see Far East Orchard also report a business update. I think it was after the close on Friday, which with a turnaround profit of 2.6 million for the first quarter of this year, uh, compared to a loss of 0.7 million in the, uh, in the first quarter for 2021, partly attributed to an unrealized exchange rate um, move with the strengthening of the Aussie dollar, as well as recognition of the sales of the, uh, was it the reversionary interest of village residents, Clark Key. But uh, we've got Far East Orchard to talk a lot more about this tonight. Let me just, um, just quickly show the segment of the stock market that has seen much turnover growth and much uh, attention by the investors and really led our Singapore stock market, much like the energy sector and the agriculture sector has led the global stock market. So as we said, for the first 18 weeks, these energy and agricultural stocks led the global stock market. There's the supply constraints from the Ukraine crisis. Um, and previously, these had also been driven by pent up demand factors as well. So among our most actively 100 traded stocks this year, Semcorp Industries, Rex, uh, Geo Energy, uh, RH Petrogas, Golden Energy and Resources, First Resources, um, uh, and, and RH Petrogas, sorry, I've, 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 that's a problem when I start reading out stock names. They, the, looking, at the, looking at the, on the energy side, it's Semcorp Industry, Rex International, Geo Energy, um, Golden Energy uh, and Resources, as well as RH Petrogas, those five. They've averaged 77% gains in the year to date. That followed 176 gains the year before. But that's predominantly because Brent crude oil is trading 45% above its end of 2021 levels. While at the same time, our May uh, Indonesia thermal coal futures are also trading 90% above their 2021 levels. On the agriculture side, crude palm oil producers have also outpaced the region in the year to date. Golden Agri Resources, First Resources, and Bumitangi Agri they rank among our 100 stocks by turnover, as, as we said, and they've averaged something like 40% total returns in the year to date, following 30% total returns on average last year. July CPO futures, they are also trading um, more than 50% above their end of 2021 levels. So just on some of the financials for last year, which provided a base for this increase in turnover, basically the combined turnover of these stocks, it went up from $24 million on average a day last year to so far $61 million a day so far this year. So the turnover of these stocks combined has gone up 250%. We had the financials as well. We mentioned um, Semcorp industry before, but Rex International recorded revenue. I think it was 150 million US dollars. That was a 240% increase from the year before. So this is for their 2021 year. Um, RH Petrogas, I think net profit, was a turnaround as well, 27 million US uh, for last year, a sharp reversal from the loss of 5 million in 2020. Golden Energy Resources had record revenue, I think $642 million uh, US dollars last year. That was up 110% uh, up, uh, thereabouts from 2020. And Golden Energy Resources revenue also crossed the 10 billion US dollar level, all time high. Uh, First Resources also delivered record revenue. Um, I think its top line revenue was up 55% uh, year on year thereabouts. And then stronger production also enabled Bumitama Agri to capitalize on these soaring prices like many of the commodity plays have. And it surpassed, I think the um, Indo Indonesian uh, 10 trillion uh, ringgit revenue milestone and made that uh, record breaking profit uh, last year as well. So that's just a quick sum up of what's been moving in our market. As we said, plenty of factors uh, are at play. Uh, more on the real estate and the hospitality is to follow. And I'm really looking forward to, to this next presentation. And I will, uh, I'll stop the sharing now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for the market updates. Up next, uh, may I invite uh, Mr. Ellington and Joanna from Far East Orchard Limited uh, to do the corporate presentation. Over to you, Mr. Tang and uh, Joanna. Firstly, I'd like to thank uh, CIAS for organizing the session. And I also like to thank all attendees for taking your time to attend this evening with us. 
and for being interested to find out more about Fly's object. Um, Joanna and I will share uh, more about Fly's object in the subsequent slides. Yeah. This is our agenda today, and I'll take the first two items on the agenda while Joanna will cover the financial highlights and outlook for the year. All right, FIS Octo Limited, uh, which used to be called uh, Octo Parade Holdings Limited, was uh, previously recognized as a hotel and a property developer. But in 2012, we began our transformational journey where we underwent a strategic restructuring exercise and started the hospitality management business. Over the years, we have taken steps to build up our recurring income base through joint venture partnerships, acquisitions, and entering new markets and asset classes. This is part of our shift towards improving the quality of our earnings by strengthening our recurring income streams through our hospitality and property investment divisions. We have focused on expanding and ex enhancing our recurring income base from our hospitality and student accommodation businesses to complement earnings from our development projects. This enables us to build an enduring business that creates shareholder value. In 2020, we established the FEOR25 strategy, a strategy that focuses on the two pillars of growth, the hospitality and the purpose-built student accommodation, or PBSA for short, businesses. The unprecedented challenges uh, from COVID-19 over the past two years have affected our two pillars, particularly the hospitality business. But that didn't stop us from continuing our growth in 2020 and 2021. We added a total of uh, 3,000 rooms across 16 hotels in Singapore, Australia, Japan, and Europe. To date, our hospitality management arm has reached more than 100 hotels under our Far East hospitality umbrella. We continue to remain rooted in our FUR25 strategy and gear ourselves towards achieving our FUR25 goal. Our group business structure is divided into four segments, comprising hospitality, student accommodation, property investment, and property development. Fires Orchard now is now a real estate company with a lodging platform that aims to achieve sustainable and recurring income through a diversified and balanced portfolio. Focusing on our two pillars, we target to achieve 25,000 rooms for the hospitality portfolio and 5,000 beds for the student accommodation business by 2025. And we will be growing the portfolios through a combination of strategic partnerships, hotel management agreements, and selective acquisitions. This is an overview of our ge geographic uh, geographical representation of the markets and the segments we operate in. As at 31st December 2021, our total assets are at 2.6 billion. Last year marks an important milestone for us on our sustainability journey, reflecting our commitment to improving our sustainability efforts. Since 2017, we have been publishing our sustainability report alongside our annual report in April. And in 2021, we introduced Fires Orchard's new sustainability vision. The sustainability vision statement is built upon the pillars of ESG, environmental, social and economic aspects, and it is supported by a strong governance as the foundation. In addition, an important milestone in the group's 2021 sustainability journey is our first sustainability link loan credit facility of 50 million pounds that we managed to secure in December of 2021. Moving forward, this framework will guide our sustainability efforts and we remain committed to building a sustainable future through our real estate and lodging platform. Let me start with the hospitality business. Our hospitality business is the key contributor to the group's revenue, contributing more than 50% of our total revenue. The hospitality business is organized into three main pillars. The hospitality management runs on a fee-based business model through Far East Hospitality. This business segment accounts for around 10% of our revenue. 
The hospitality asset houses our owned and leased hospitality properties. And the hospitality investment includes our investment in our Australia hospitality joint venture with the TFE hotels, as well as our 33% shareholdings interest in the REIT manager of Far East Hospitality Trust. As shared earlier, we are committed to reaching our target of 25,000 rooms by 2025. In our pipeline, we are expecting openings of 12 properties through to 2024. And we are also expanding our geographical footprints into new countries like Switzerland and Vietnam. As at 31st March 2022, we operated over 100 properties and more than 18,000 rooms. While countries are reopening their borders, a full recovery of travel industry may still take some time due to the pressures from existing economic uncertainties. We remain prudent and are actively monitoring these potential markets and will take a disciplined approach towards expansion and acquisitions. Despite the pandemic, we took the opportunity to refurbish some of our legacy properties and did a cross uh, branding with TFE's Australia brands. Efforts to target the Australian market started in 2021, when Fires Hospitality brought uh, the Quincy brand to Melbourne, where we opened the Quincy Hotel Melbourne in March 2021. In the second half of this year, we will bring the brands Vibe Hotels and Adina into Singapore through the rebranding of our existing properties, the Elizabeth Hotel and the Regency House, which is a service residence, respectively. We believe the leveraging uh, on this long-standing collaboration with TFE enables us to look for new growth opportunities and streamline our operations to maximize synergies and efficiencies. These are significant milestones as we continue to pursue partnerships and hotel management agreements to expand the FIS hospitality brands in Singapore and overseas. In the first queue of this year, FY22, Together with our joint venture, Toga Fires Hotels, we opened three hotel properties, each in Sydney, Dusseldorf, and Stuttgart, adding 494 rooms to our hospitality portfolio. We are also expecting two new openings in the second half of the year. On 4th of March, uh, 2022, we entered into a joint venture agreement with the Real Hospitality Group Asia Coal uh, Limited. Real Hospitality Group was founded in 2010 in the United States and currently operates more than 90 hotels under the white label or franchise brands. In 2020, it has started operations in the People's Republic of China. The tourism industry in the PRC had one of the largest domestic markets in the world before COVID-19, and it is among the earliest in showing signs of recovery during the pandemic. We feel that this is an opportune time to enter the PRC market as it will help the group grow its global presence in a huge domestic market. This JV aid is not expected to have any material impact on the consolidated net earnings per share and a consolidated NTA per share for FY 2022. We will continue to push ahead and work towards achieving our 25,000 rooms or 150 properties by 2025 through a combination of strategic partnerships, securing new hotel management agreements and selective acquisitions. Next, on our PBSA business. Our focus for the student accommodation business remains in the UK where enrollment numbers for higher education continue to grow. Since the United Kingdom's removal uh, of its travel restrictions and requirements relating to COVID-19, the Universities and Colleges Admission Services, or UCAS, reported a 5% increase in application from students outside the European Union for the academic year 2022-23, starting in September of 2022 this year. And these application numbers are still rising. In the recent January application deadline, students' applications from China and India grew significantly by 12% and 11%, respectively with China remaining the third biggest market for the UK higher education. As at 31st March, 2022, our portfolio has seen reservations for the academic year of 2022 and 23 
of over 80%, surpassing the prior year's reservation at this point in time. The group has uh, been building its PBSA portfolio since uh, FY 2016. As part of our FUR 25 strategy, we have set a target to grow our PBSA portfolio to 5,000 beds by 2025. Over the past five years, our PBSA portfolio has increased by five-fold, gearing us towards our target. There also is a very strong investor interest in this sector. Our target of 5,000 beds was chosen after careful consideration and deliberation between the board and management. It strikes a balance between a re reasonable growth rate in a post-COVID environment that will expand our asset base and generate stable long-term returns for the shareholders while not being overly ambitious that we may end up too aggressive for asset acquisitions. We remain confident in the UK PBSA sector. I would now provide some quick updates on our property development and investment businesses. We currently have two completed property development projects, Wood Square in Singapore and Westminster Fire Station in the London, UK. Sales and leasing activities at Wood Square have slowed down in FY 2021 due to the uncertainty wrought on by COVID-19 and COVID viewing restrictions. Nonetheless, we managed to sell 10 units in 2021. As at March 2022, 71% of the 208 units launched have been sold. The retail premises at Wood Square are 100% leased and will continue to provide a recurring income stream. Sales launched for the Westminster Fire Station started at the end of March 2022. Under our portfolio of purpose built medical suites for lease and for sale in Singapore's premier medical hub in Novena, the occupancy rate of the portfolio is currently 100%. The medical suites are returning a market rented yield of about 2%, and it will continue to provide us with a stable recurring income. Next, Joanna will take us through the financial highlights and outlook for FY22. Joanna? Thank you, Alan. Now, um, let me share the group's full year 2021 results and how the group has performed for the first quarter of 2022. The group financial performance for FY21 was adversely impacted by the protracted COVID-19 pandemic. Our hospitality business, which continues to be the biggest contributor to our revenue, was one of the hardest hit sector of the pandemic. So revenue declined by 4.8% to 106.8 million in 2021, and the operating profit for the group for FI21 was also lowered at 4.4 million. The hospitality business was impacted by the COVID-19 restrictions and the ongoing lockdowns and border closures. Our hospitality business in Australia actually suffered the hardest hit last year due to the extended border closures and snap lockdowns throughout the year. The declines in the hospitality business was partially mitigated by higher contributions from the group's student accommodation business in the UK and various government grants received during the year. Despite the poorer operating performance, for 2021, the group recorded a profit after tax of 16.8 million as compared to a net loss of 8.9 million in 2020. And this was mainly due to fair value gains on the investment properties of almost 44 million. Most of these fair value gains are from the group's student accommodation assets in the UK and if you exclude these fair value gains, the group would have actually registered a wider net loss as compared to 2020. Profit attributable to the equity holders increased to 28.1 million, resulting in the earnings per share of 6.12 cents. Cash balance as at 31st December 2021 declined by 23.2 million to 255.2 million. As the group continued to fund the hospitality business, which had been impacted by the pandemic. Nonetheless, the group balance sheet and liquidity positions remains healthy due to the vigilance we have taken in conserving our cash and management of the balance sheets over the years. The healthy balance sheets provided us not only the ability to weather any impending uncertainties, but also the financial flexibility for future growth and expansion of business in accordance with our FUOR25 strategy. 
Moving to our first quarter uh, numbers, in the first quarter this year, 2022, the group recorded a net profit after tax of 2.2 million versus a loss of 3.2 million in the first quarter of 2021. This was mainly due to the unrealized exchange gain from the strengthening of Australian dollar against the Singapore dollar and the recognitions of the sales of the reversionary interest of village residents club key. Uh, the sales completed in March itself this year. And compared to first quarter 2021, the group's hospitality business showed an improvement in performance and the PBSA business re remained resilient. Vice Orchard remains committed to delivering shareholder value. For 2021, the company will be paying a first and final dividend of 3 cents per share, maintaining it at the same level as 2020, despite the group continuing to operate in a protracted COVID-19 pandemic environment. We have been able to tide through the unprecedented crisis thanks to our strong balance sheet. And it is important for us to remain prudent and to conserve financial resources to face the continued uncertainties that may lie ahead and maintain sufficient resources for business expansions and diversifications. 2022 was initially expected to be the year when the global post-COVID recovery gained momentum. However, the outlook for 2022 remains clouded with uncertainties as the geopolitical tensions and the macro environmental factors linger into the year, hampering the overall confidence and the recovery of tourism. On top of that, to counter global inflation, central banks around the world are increasing interest rates, which will inevitably impact our financing costs. Nonetheless, we continue to remain focused on creating a stronger, bigger fire orchard by building a lodging platform that delivers sustainable returns for our stakeholders over the long term. For the hospitality business outlook, tourism continues to be one of the most directly affected sectors by COVID-19. Full recovery is expected to be at least two years away. At the start of 2022, international tourism took a pause in the gradual recovery with the Omicron variant outbreak earlier this year. As of now, more countries are easing or lifting travel restrictions. Let me share briefly the outlook in each of our key markets, namely Singapore, Australia, Germany, and the UK. Singapore has fully reopened borders to all fully vaccinated travellers, including the land borders between Singapore and Malaysia from 1st of April this year. We expect businesses from the government isolation business and the movement control order, which is MCO we call it, in Singapore to decline sharply. In addition, despite the opening of the international borders, China being one of Singapore's key inbound source markets still has its border closed. Thus, this will affect Singapore tourism recovery. For Australia and Germany, the strong domestic markets will continue to stir the recovery of these two markets. While Germany has earlier already opened its borders to all fully vaccinated visitors, Australia reopened its international borders fully on 21st of February this year, and then followed by Western Australia, which opened its border in, uh, on March of 3rd of March. We are witnessing a positive trend in domestic bookings in Australia. We are hopeful that the increase in international flights will boost Australia tourism, although recovery from corporate demand is expected to be slow. As we welcome the reopening of international borders, the group is gearing up to recapture pent up travel demands. However, the overall travel confidence will still be affected by some uncertainties associated with COVID-19 resurgence and various downside risks, including those posed by the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war, which will hamper the recovery of tourism. We will continue to monitor the situations in the markets where we have a presence and make calculated steps to achieve our FUR25 targets. As for the PBSA outlook, the easing of the UK COVID restrictions and the positive student demands from both domestic and non-EU international students will continue to drive the performance of this business segment. Based on the January 2022 application data for the academic year 2022-2023, the UCAS reported a 5% application increase. International students who are likely to live in PBSA were 4% higher than last year. 
As of 18th of March 2022, the UK has removed all travel restrictions and requirements related to COVID-19. We believe this will be an added advantage for international students who are interested to pursue higher education in the UK. We expect confidence of the PBSA demand and the number of students is expected to grow by two thirds between now and 2026. Hence, we will continue to pursue opportunities to extend this business segment. In summary, while hospitality business persists to be one of the most challenged sector, the outlook of the group PBSA business in the UK remains resilient. As the group hospitality segments remains its biggest contributor, coupled with the near-term challenges faced by the hospitality industry, the operating performance for 2022 is expected to remain under pressure. Thank you once again for your interest in Fires Orchard. I will pass it back to Benjamin. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, may I now invite uh, Mr. Tang to also just join us, uh, turn on your uh, video. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we have come to the Q&A session. Um, yes, Mr. Benjamin Goh is our Head of Research and Investor Education. Uh, he will be moderating tonight's uh, Q&A session. Over to you guys. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Tang as well, Joanna. Very illuminating presentation. Um, very grateful that uh, you are able to join us today. Um, so as usual, on behalf of the retail investors, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, we do have two pre-submitted questions. Um, they are kind of generally in the uh, same team. Uh, so I'll just uh, read them out. So um, one question, I have been holding Far East Orchards for the last 10 years. Uh, why has the why is the share price 60% lower than its uh, net asset value? Okay, um, Benji, thank you. Yeah, I, I think as far as share price are concerned and uh, where they are at, right, um, the movements and the, the trading liquidity are really subject to the market forces. Uh, somehow beyond our control. Um, what the board and the management uh, are responsible for and has been very committed is um, uh, the strategies and the execution of it that I've shared uh, uh, at length uh, at my presentation. And definitely I'm uh, appealing to shareholders to take a longer term view um, uh, what, what, to, to look at what the board and the management has set out to do. Um, and we are committed to executing our FUR25 strategy in building this logic platform um, and therefore, to make a, a more sustainable and recurring income uh, as our base. Um, I, I suppose the one, one thing is really to get this message out more, conducting more frequent engagement like such uh, with the analysts and also with the shareholders. Yeah, uh, thanks. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, certainly, folks, uh, net asset value is not the only indicator of a value for a company. So there are um, you know, some other things that go into the equation. All right. Uh, the second pre-submitted question here is that the share price of the company has uh, really moved. I suppose in the long term, it has gone up and come down a little bit. Uh, what is the upside for shareholders? Uh, please comment. Um, again, I'll have to uh, refer back to uh, what we are committed to do. Um, again, our, we, are, we, are, we are confident of our uh, strategy as how we are actually um, um, redefining uh, and um, our new narrative for FISE Orchard um, to really focus on these two uh, strong pillars that we have uh, uh, built up over the years um, of some uh, strength and uh, to continue to look at it uh, and shore up as a uh, lodging platform and to help us to scale further uh, for the future. So at this point in time, our um, five-year plan up to 2025 is a target of 25,000 rooms and 5,000 beds uh, for PBSA. And that is our uh, sort of interim targets uh, to get our lodging platform um, to a certain size and, uh, and so that we can actually um, build on it to scale up our 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 uh, business and uh, going forward. So there are many um, uh, things that we could do uh, once we actually get this uh, to a, a sizable uh, 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 platform um, and 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 work on it to 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 uh, deliver better, consistent, uh, sustainable, recurring income for the shareholders. Yeah. And certainly the COVID pandemic has not been helpful uh, for anybody at all. 
right? Uh, not just for the PBSA, but also for tourism in general. Um, okay, so we have got a couple of questions that have been submitted uh, online. Uh, when was the last valuation uh, done for medical suites? You mentioned a 2% yield. Is that still an attractive return to continue holding the investment? Um, I, we, we do our valuation annually. Um, so uh, the medical suites uh, has been holding their values um, for the last uh, uh, couple of years. Um, so um, this 2% uh, um, return uh, during this uh, two past year, especially has been valuable. Um, as I mentioned, it is 100% leased. Um, we are constantly actually uh, open to the market um, uh, offering um, and uh, giving us a, 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 a price point to, to exit and to sell. Um, we have always uh, taken that approach. It's not something that we are holding uh, uh, on uh, uh, for dear life, but uh, it has to be a price that uh, is uh, uh, um, reflective of the valuation and we are not prepared to take any uh, loss for no reason. So that is more um, our approach to uh, a very stabilized uh, uh, asset uh, uh, to of this nature, yeah. But I must again repeat to say that uh, the last two years, they have been really uh, lifesavers, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine, uh, I mean, given that, uh, you know, regardless of what's happening, uh, people still get sick and then they still need to have medical services, right? Um, okay, next question. Um, the current earnings per share, how much of it is recurring, I suppose recurring or sustaining, uh, sustainable? And um, I guess that's the question. So what is the weightage of EPS that's recurring? Okay, um, maybe I need just answer this because um, in terms of the EPS, um, the, our hospitality business actually is our core, uh, one of our key contributions from the recurring income. However, over the last uh, two years, the hospitality business has been the one that is actually uh, loss making. So um, most of the uh, earnings that is coming from, uh, in terms of the weight, the last two years with uh, weightage of the EPS will be a bit, uh, a bit skewed in terms of the uh, weightage. Um, but in a stabilized year, we will expect that most of the way uh, as we actually work through our, because right now our hospitality business and the PBSA business actually accounts for close to 80% of our total assets. And um, as we come out of COVID, when, uh, and when from the recovery of the COVID, right, you will see that should comes back to the expected normalized uh, weightage of EPS should be about 80 20 in terms of recurring versus non recurring. Mm, so, okay. yeah, so basically, the last two years, if you yeah. look at the EPS, it's a little bit skewed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, certainly it's not a steady state, not for uh, anybody. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, next question is about the, uh, I guess, the PBSA sector in the UK. So uh, you had mentioned growth in international students in the UK. Quite heartening to see that there are more applications for students studying in the UK. Uh, how does it compare with the pre-COVID numbers and how long do you expect it? Uh, how long do you expect before it reaches pre-COVID levels? I guess the question is when we get back to steady state in terms of uh, you know, uh, international students uh, staying in PPSA. Um, I think our uh, mix of um, international student to domestic student in our portfolio has been in the 80-20. Uh, I mean, 80 uh, domestic and 20 international, uh, even pre-COVID level. Um, so um, that, that, that uh, component is uh, therefore um, not the largest, uh, but yet, um, I, uh, I think I've uh, stressed that at this point in time, uh, uh, even as we are looking at the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the bookings and the reservations, it is actually already um, uh, pretty much at the pre-COVID level. Because um, other than 2020, when uh, COVID uh, hit, uh, which hit that semester, it's a bad academic year itself, because uh, people are... Uh, 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 the, the university had to close and they have to actually um, uh, go back to uh, their homes. Uh, uh, that, that actually caused uh, some disruption that year. Um, last year, we already had uh, come back to almost a good 90, 95% of our pre-COVID kind of occupancy. Uh, and uh, this year, at, as, as I shared uh, earlier, the, the, look, the bookings on the book for the next FY 2022-23 
is very very encouraging. <laughs> we almost uh, probably uh, uh, we we can uh, pretty much say that we are uh, very confident in hitting our pre COVID level, if not surpassing. Yeah. Mm. Mm, so that, okay, that's a very encouraging news. Um, certainly a very good uh, positive. Um, I guess factor uh, in the favor of uh, Vice Orchard. Um, so I do have a question, uh, you know, from myself. So you had mentioned in your PowerPoint that um, uh, you are going to be investing quite a fair bit in the PVSA um, sector, right? Um, so my question relates to uh, funding. So given the you know high interest rate environment, uh, as well as uh, I guess volatility in capital markets, um, could you explain a little bit on your um, I guess your funding model? Uh, how do you intend to fund the expansion in your um, assets? Mm. Um, I I think the the the. the the plan that we have put together, uh, our strategy uh, together with the board, uh, take into consideration our capital structure and what our balance sheet has, um, which again um, explains why we uh, take a lot of care and pride in uh, our uh, cash holdings uh, and uh, the lines that we have. Um, and we know that uh, within this uh, possibility and these capabilities, we are able to reach the target that we have set ourselves for uh, to reach the 5,000 beds. So that's not an issue. Um, so so uh, suffice to say, we are able to uh, reach that target um, without having any issue on, uh, on, on, the, on, on our capital yeah, um, structure in our current balance sheet. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's very encouraging news. Um, all right, uh, question. The Singapore hospitality market, are room rates currently back to the pre-COVID levels? What about other major markets like Australia, Germany, so and so forth? Uh, I think uh, if I say it is, I think you will not believe me. Like, yeah. So, so uh, it is a, a given that uh, we are still not uh, covered um, mm -hmm. and therefore the room rates are still uh, uh, shy of uh, where we are. But I think uh, for the hospitality sector, um, more often, we will be looking at uh, a ref par, yep. which is the combination of the rates and the occupancy, and that is a more reflective uh, of the total uh, out outlook. Um, so Singapore, uh, like uh, 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 Jeff mentioned earlier about the uh, uh, Changi Airport arrival, 40% uh, pre-COVID level is still 40%. And uh, mm -hmm. what comes true to Singapore and hitting our shores uh, is a, a trickle of that. Uh. Um, so suffice to say, if you do the math, um, we are probably uh, maybe about 40% uh, right now in terms of uh, 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 occupancy uh, uh, level. Uh, and then plus, I think the rates um, uh, with a uh, with, uh, government business slowly uh, 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 being um, curtailing and taken away, it will be then slowly returning back to the actual uh, rates for um, that, that we are charging for the business itself. And therefore, it will be a lift in, in, in the room rates going forward. But suffice to say, when you blend the two together, you're probably at, still at the 50% or 40, uh, 50 odd percent uh, of pre-COVID level. Um, and that phenomena probably differs uh, slightly across Australia and German market because of their uh, uh, probably stronger reliance on domestic or in, Europe, in Germany is more uh, inter, inter Europe uh, uh, travel. Um, so I think they are probably at a better position uh, uh, at this point in time, uh, given the borders are reopening, uh, at least uh, even for Australia uh, within their interstate border, um, they, they do uh, um, rely a lot on their domestic travel. Um, I think they are probably catching up a, 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 a tad better than Singapore in terms of ref par. I would venture a guess about 60, 60 odd percent uh, to yeah, uh, kind of uh, pre-COVID level. There's still mm. some, some way to go. La. Yeah. Mm. Well, but certainly, uh, you know, just based on uh, anecdotal personal experience, a lot of the hotel or the popular hotels are kind of, uh, I mean, demand is coming back. La. Right, yes. you can see people going shopping, and uh, well, for the life of me, I cannot get a reservation at Colony at Ritz Carlton. <laughs> so I booked up for the next few months, so I'm not sure whether you're seeing that kind of demand for your uh, restaurants and property as well. But I mean, I think, it's certainly coming yeah. back. 
I think restaurant people are eating for sure. Yeah. They, 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 that, that Singaporean, is a factor. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, so, so again, hotels, I think the staycation has a, a, a sort of emptied out again because they're traveling out already. They no longer are kept uh, 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 locked in Singapore, right? So now we do actually have to look at the foreign market and the, the international market coming back and staying in Singapore, yeah, with us. So, uh, yeah, I think I think it is uh, the 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 optimism is there. Uh, uh, um, we are seeing it, but uh, uh, but we have to be. I think just be a bit cautious for mm. like what Joanna was uh, sharing about the outlook. Uh, there are mm. uh, uh, challenges ahead. Um, be it the supply ch uh, uh, manpower chain, shortage. Uh, manpower yeah. shortage uh, that that we are still facing. And um, um, I mean, God bless the, uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine, right? And how the war will, will turns out. Um, uh, uh, any so so these are uh, power, uh, 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 energy, um, inflation uh, rate. Uh, mm. Those are actually uh, quite a few things overhanging as well, as we uh, look uh, uh, optimistically to the recovery of the sector. Okay. Uh, all right. Next question is about Toga Trust. Who are the JV partners, uh, are they Australians? Mm. Okay, wow. <laughs> I didn't know there's an interest in the partners. Okay, uh, I, I, the, 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 what I know about them, of course, they have a long history. They have, stayed, uh, they have uh, 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 settled in Australia for a long time, but they are originally uh, uh, from uh, uh, Germany, and, and uh, I believe they are Jews as well, uh, mm. who have settled there. Um, and, uh, and then subsequently uh, um, into Australia, yeah. So uh, suffice to say, they are Australians, and uh, we we our our we always refer to them as our Australian uh, JV partner. Yeah, that that is, uh, and most of their business actually uh, started out from there, uh, and then with uh, with uh, Europe. That's why our Europe uh, uh, we do have a a, a good um, uh, exposure there as well in Germany, mm. especially. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, all right. Next question. In your careful expansion, what has been done to attract and retain the necessary talent given the competitiveness of the hospitality industry? And, and again, you know, from anecdotal personal experience, today I went out for lunch. The service levels are definitely not bad, like long queues and all that. I mean, certainly I think there is still a talent crunch in the regard for service levels, not just in Singapore, but globally as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose we pride ourselves again during uh, the COVID period. Uh, uh, it's really during the difficult times, how do you treat them? Uh, and, 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 and I think FOIS uh, organization as a group itself has, this, uh, has always had this uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, known to, to be uh, 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 good to the, to the employees and, uh, and uh, try to be uh, 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 as uh, exemplary an employee as possible. And that that um, is, I think, our biggest uh, uh, way to um, uh, retain uh, 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 talent uh, when the market turns up. Um, hopefully, they they do uh, they do uh, uh, treasure that more than just dollars and cents. But again, um, the the competition is real. We are not fooling ourselves, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, in different industry. You know when the, 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 the IT and the, the, the FinTech um, kind of uh, come in and um, pay you 20, 30% more, it's kind of hard to say no. Um, and that one, we will just have to bless them to go ahead, um, you know, and, uh, and, and hopefully we'll, our, our, our path will, will, will cross again. But I think the, the main thing is really to be um, sincere and true and, and real to, 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 to them um, uh, after, especially during the downtime, um, so that they know that uh, we 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 don't uh, let them go. Uh, I think uh, the the biggest um, thing is that we we never let anyone go uh, during the the pandemic, and that is the biggest uh, uh, I think uh, testimony that we can talk about from from ourselves. Mm. I guess it's a very heartening news. I mean, uh, you're striving to be the employer of choice so that uh, you can support your employees during tough times as well as the good times. Yeah. Um, all right, back to inflation. Okay, how do you see the rising inflation and interest rates affect your yield generating real estate portfolio? Mm -hmm. 
uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll let you uh, take this. <laughs> okay, I think from a um, management perspective, right, from the terms of the rising inflation, everywhere is facing it. So from an operation perspective, we are looking at, of course, increasing the revenue to counter the rising inflation. So that must that is something that we are, um, across the businesses, whether it's in the PBSA business or in the hospitality business, Revenue growth is definitely one area that we look at. Then, of course, in terms of efficiency and productivity uh, from a cost management perspective in order to counter the rising inflation. So that definitely flows through to our um, in, uh, and, uh, net operating income on, on our real estate assets. And hope, um, we are very mindful of all this uh, cost increase and, of course, the interest rate. So the key driver is actually to grow our uh, operating income and henceforth to balance, uh, to still continue to get the yield that we, uh, the market yield that we are expecting from these assets. Yeah. So that's how we will uh, manage our uh, this, which we can, nobody can avoid at this moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess in that sense, it's a level playing field. All businesses globally will have to contend with higher inflation. Yep. That's just part right. of the economic cycle. Yeah. Um, okay. We have got one more question. Is there a possibility of merger with Far East Hospitality Trust? Uh, I guess uh, we should have expected this since there's an overlap of the holdings of the uh, hospitality assets. Uh, well, um, I I think Foyce Hospitality Trust is uh, set up for a uh, reason. Uh, is uh, is again to avail themselves right to 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 the to the retail investor uh, for um, owning a piece of uh, assets uh, and the business. Um, in fact, all of Foyce Hospitality Trust uh, assets are actually managed by our management uh, arm. Uh, so uh, the the. I, I wouldn't say there's overlapping of uh, holding hospitality assets, but actually there is a complementary. Uh, we uh, managed um, one of uh, our Fire's Hospitality uh, is the operator and we managed uh, the assets that they own. Um, again, uh, uh, from our perspective, as I shared earlier in our FUR25 strategy, while we focus on the hospitality uh, business and building that platform, uh, it is actually the operating platform that I'm also uh, focusing on and building the capabilities of brands and delivery of uh, service standards uh, across uh, Singapore and the region. Um, so uh, that, that actually is a quite a different business in and of itself. Um, and, and we can scale that and we can manage any other uh, uh, assets uh, holder uh, or rather owner, not necessarily FEHT. Um, uh, and, and that is actually uh, what we are doing now with uh, with several of our uh, overseas assets, right? With uh, different owners. So I, I think uh, just want to clarify that our business actually doesn't uh, overlap, and it's quite clear uh, direction as to where we are taking uh, 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 the the different entity. Yeah. Mm. Okay, uh, and uh, we do have one last question. Uh, the new pipeline of rooms in Switzerland and Vietnam. Um, why in this relatively new market by the management? I guess the question is why invest or you know set up shop in Switzerland and Vietnam? I, I suppose it dovetails very nicely to the earlier part that I just talked about in explaining our business. These are not investments that we made in the asset itself. It is actually management and operating uh, 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 services that we are providing. Um, so both the Vietnam uh, assets, like I said, is a different owner. Uh, in Vietnam that uh, we had, uh, 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 I mean, won the management rights uh, too. Uh, and it is a new market that we will, uh, we are interested in because Vietnam, uh, just like I think China, Indonesia has very strong domestic uh, uh, market. And that is actually how we are seeing during, or we learned during the, the COVID uh, 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 the past two years that the, um, the, 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 the importance of domestic market uh, in, 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 in keeping the, the industry going. Um, kind of unlike Singapore, which is uh, one that uh, no matter how we're just looking at the staycation of the Singaporeans and that is not going to suffice you see, uh, in, in propping up the, the, the industry. So um, Vietnam is, is one of the key market that we are looking at expanding further. This is just a toehold. Uh, we, we will uh, spend more uh, time to build that up based on this, uh, this, uh, this uh, entry point, so to speak. Yeah. So Switzerland similarly is actually uh, uh, 
drive out of our TFE JV out in Europe, and they are looking at uh, uh, they did definitely look at uh, regions around Germany uh, as their base uh, to 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 reach out. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, for my part, I'll certainly support uh, Faris by eating out more as well as doing staycations. There's a lot of pent up demand in my household for those. <laughs> <laughs> been locked up for too long. Uh, so thank you very much, Mr. Tang, as well as Joanna. So jokes aside, very appreciative for your time this evening. Uh, I think we've got a very good mix of questions and certainly you've provided a lot of uh, clarity to some of the, to the questions that the uh, viewers had. So thank you very much. Mm, thank, you. thank you. Yeah, hopefully there's a, there's a, a, a help to clarify um, some of their doubts and their, uh, their, their yeah. Um, you know, just as a kind of a... Um, advertising for Sians, we do really hope to see, um, you know, Fire's Orchard more often, because certainly there is a good story emerging, um, especially once, uh, you know, we head back to a steady state uh, pre-COVID -co pre levels, right? So we are certainly will be looking forward to seeing how Fire is, um, you know, uh, evolves over time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so we do, uh, I guess, pre-invite you for some future talk, so maybe six months later or something. Thank you. I'll be happy to uh, to 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 uh, keep um, uh, the shareholders uh, and see us uh, abreast of our development and our growth. Uh, that's again, hopefully uh, that messaging will help <laughs> to move the share price. I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Eileen, over back uh, back over to you. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, for Ms. Tang, uh, it's heartening to know that uh, there will be more collaborations with uh, Far East Orchard. Yeah, so now we have come to the end of the session. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. In case you missed any part of the today's uh, session, you can rewatch the webinar on Sia's YouTube channel. Corporate Connect is a bi-monthly webinar. Do visit our website to get updates on upcoming investors education programs and initiatives. The upcoming Copper Connect will be featuring UOB Assets Management on the 24th of May. Uh, thank you and have a good evening. Thank you.